81 tonight. Psalm 81, we are continuing on with the Psalms of Asaph section here in Psalms. Psalm 81, this is a relatively short psalm. We will, Lord willing, get through the whole thing tonight. As is usually the case with the Psalms, the superscription for this Psalm is for the choir director on the Giddeth of Asaph. Now, as also is usually the case with these superscriptions, it is really unknown exactly what it means when it says Giddeth there. Perhaps it's a tune, perhaps it's some kind of string instruments. There are several suggestions as to what that means, uh, but it's it's kind of obscure, so we don't really know what that means. But the audience who would have originally read this or sung this or recited this would have known, but uh, it doesn't matter. We can certainly understand uh, what the psalm is about even without knowing that superscription. So let's pray, and we'll get started. Father God, we come to you, and I pray that you would hide me behind the cross, that I would preach and teach in a way that brings glory to you, that's effective to each of us, dear Lord, that we would open our ears and our heart to hear. God, I pray that we would hear what we need to hear from your word tonight. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Verse 1. Sing for joy to God our strength. Shout in triumph to the God of Jacob. Lift up a song. Play the tambourine, the melodious lyre, and the harp. Blow the horn on the day of our feast, during the new moon and during the full moon. So here at the beginning of this psalm, it is a psalm of praise. It's praising to the Lord. It's singing to the Lord because of the great strength of the Lord. We see not only the song being sang, but also instruments listed there, the harp and the tambourine, the blowing of the horn. So this was a, a joyous celebration and singing praises to the Lord, uh, perhaps not so dissimilar from what we just finished doing. It says on the day of the feast during the new moon and the full moon, uh, it's hard to know exactly which feast this is speaking of here. There were a few feasts in the Old Testament that the, that the uh, people of Israel uh, were to keep, and, and this type of atmosphere, this singing praise to the Lord, would have occurred at, at these feasts. Perhaps uh, this was Passover or Tabernacle. Those seem to be the, 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 the most, uh, uh, the two that's, that, that, are, that are often suggested here for the possible feast. The new moon or the full moon, there's, uh, that's pretty uh, easy for us to understand there. We, we see those phases, or excuse me, we see those uh, phrases in the Old Testament new moon and full moon, uh, but it just simply has to do with the moon, with the phases of the moon that we see in the sky. Even today, uh, there is a new moon every month. There is a full moon uh, uh, every month, uh, or sometimes two a month, depending on exactly how it falls. But uh, there were certain times that these festivals or things were supposed to take place, and whether it was a feast or a new moon or a full moon, these were to be accompanied with praise to the Lord. Verse 4, for this is a statute for Israel, a judgment of, God, of the God of Jacob. He set it up as an ordinance for Joseph when he went throughout the land of Egypt. I heard an unfamiliar language. So this idea of praising the Lord was, was my translation there says judgment. Yours may say uh, ordinance or something like that. That was, that is, it's a command of the Lord that, that the people of God were supposed to do the things that he commanded, that they were supposed to praise him, that these things were established by God for his people. They were a law to his people. And he set up this ordinance for Joseph. Now, not so unlike what we saw last week in Psalm 80. We saw the mention of Joseph and Benjamin and Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, this is probably just another way of referencing God's people, of referencing Israel. Now, we also see the mention of Egypt here when he uh, went throughout the land of Egypt. So, 
That is, this praise of the Lord should come because God delivered his people. And when he delivered his people, he commanded them to, to keep certain things and to do certain things and to remember him at certain times and to pass these things down to other generations. So perhaps the reference to Egypt here is also why Joseph is mentioned here because Joseph was a tie-in there as we see that story at the end of Genesis to that time in Egypt and the ultimate deliverance there. And then and then we see uh, at the end of verse 5 here, I heard an unfamiliar language. Now, it's hard to know exactly what that is referring to. A couple of suggestions, both which would fit, would be this is hearkening back to the time that God's people were in Egypt, and that is they were among foreigners, and they heard foreign language and foreign praise to foreign gods, and that's the, the time frame and the language that is being referenced here. That is certainly a possibility, uh, but it's also a possibility that, that what's being heard here is, is a reference to what is to follow in the next few verses. I think that, that the second option there, at least to me, seems like the better fit because here we're about to see the Lord is going to begin to speak. So perhaps the psalmist here is saying, I heard something that was unique, a unique voice, a unique sound, something that, that I did not understand, something that I had never heard before, the voice of the Lord. And so perhaps when he says here, I heard an unfamiliar language, perhaps he's saying, I'm hearing the Lord speak. And that's a rare occurrence. That's not something that that probably occurred very often in the Old Testament uh, and certainly is not something that occurs much today, at least not in a, in a physical voice, that we hear the Lord speak to us audibly in a physical voice. Now, we may hear the Lord speak through the Holy Spirit, but here we have the Lord speaking in these next few verses. Verse 6, I relieved his shoulder from the burden. His hands were freed from carrying the basket. You called out in distress, and I rescued you. I answered you from the thundercloud. I tested you at the waters of Meribah, Selah. So here is the Lord speaking. We have just referenced that time in Egypt. And for God's people in Egypt, it was a time of burden. It was a time of slavery. Now, it's likely that that time period was about 150 years or so. This was a long time that they were in there. Now, uh, a whole other topic that we've addressed in the past, and I'll be glad to talk about it sometime, but we won't tonight for time purposes. The, the, the mention of 400 years or 430 years, uh, especially made popular by the Ten Commandments movie where the slaves said we've been enslaved for 400 years. But when you look at the numbers and add them up, that's uh, probably not accurate. It probably was more like 150 years or so that they were enslaved. But regardless of the time frame, whether it was a shorter period or a 400-year period, how, how long do you want to be enslaved? Well, probably no more than today. That's probably sufficient. And so regardless of how long that they were burdened for, God relieved them in their time of burden. He delivered them from their time of burden. And what does it say? They called out to God in their distress. Now, we need to remember to do that. Now, that's one of those things that goes without saying. But sometimes you need to say the things that go without saying. That is, we need to call out to God in our times of distress. We know that, but sometimes we don't do that. We know that, and sometimes we forget that. But we need to be reminded sometimes of even the most simple things. And that is, if you are in a time of distress, you need to call out to the Lord. And what does he do here? He says, and I rescued you. I answered from the thundercloud, the powerful presence of God showing up onto the scene to deliver his people. Verse 8, listen, my people, and I will admonish you, Israel, if you would only listen to me. There must not be a strange God among you. You must not bow down to a foreign God. I am Yahweh, your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. So God gave these commands and these instructions to his people. When he brought them out of Egypt, when he was bringing them through the wilderness, when he was bringing them into the promised land, he told them, don't put any other gods before me. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And don't put any gods before it not to worship any false idols. These were commands that God gave to his people not long after bringing them out of the land of Egypt. 
And what does he say? Listen, and I will admonish you, Israel, if you would only listen to me. There must not be strange gods among you. You must not bow down to foreign gods. But what did God's people do? They did exactly what he told them not to do. They did have strange gods. That is, any god that was not him is a strange god, a god that should have been strange to them. Because what god had delivered them from Egypt? Only Yahweh, the god of Israel. Any other god was a strange god to them, an unknown god to them. Yet these unknown gods, these strange gods that had done nothing for them, yet we see that they begin to bow down to these foreign gods. Perhaps we are guilty of such behavior. Maybe not an idol made with human hands, but perhaps there are other gods that we have brought before us in our lives that we bow down to with our time and our money and our attention. Perhaps there are gods in our life that have taken the place of God, just as he did for the people of Israel. But what does God say? I brought you up from the land of Egypt. And, and then he says, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. That is, I want to provide for you. You are dependent on me. You will not survive without me. So open up and let me feed you. Perhaps the imagery, uh, one illustration that I heard, which I think is a good illustration, is that of a baby bird. A baby bird sitting in the nest. And what does the mama bird do? She comes and she puts the food right there in the baby bird's mouth. And perhaps that's a good visual aid for us that we are helpless and we are hopeless. But God comes to us and he provides for our needs. But we have to open our mouth. We can't sit there and go, mm, and say, boy, I'm, I'm hungry. I wish I could eat. But we got our mouth closed. No, if we want to be filled, we must open our mouth. And God said, I delivered you. I brought you out. I gave you good instructions. I took care of you. And I want to bless you. But you got to open your mouth. But too many times, God's people didn't open their mouth. Or when they did, they may have opened the mouth in praise to a false god. <clears throat> and that's what we see in verse 11. But my people did not listen to me. Israel did not obey me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own plans. Now, that's a pretty scary couple of verses for me. I don't know about you guys, but when I read those verses, I think, okay, this is scary because, one, sometimes I am like Israel, and sometimes I do not listen to what God's Word says. Now, maybe you guys all listen to God's Word all the time, and I hope you do. But there are times in my life that I do not. There are times in my life that I want to make my plans and do things my way. And as the proverb says, we can make our plans, but it's the Lord's plans that will prevail. Now, I'm paraphrasing there, but we see several verses along those lines throughout the Old Testament. And so we may have this, 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 this habit as humans that we're going to make our plans, and this is how things are going to work out, and we plan it out just the way we want to with, ever, with never once seeking the Lord and saying, God, is this a good plan? Is this what you would have me do? Now, we can think of all the reasons why it's good, but if God says it ain't, then guess what? It ain't good. And here's the scary part of that verse. Sometimes God gives people over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own plans. Now, that's scary because the plans that we make that we think are fantastic, that we've got things planned out, oftentimes fall apart and blow up in our face. But sometimes if there's a plan that we are determined that we are going to do it, sometimes God says, okay, do it. And that's a bad place to be. And perhaps we have been there before doing the plans that we have worked out only to find, uh-oh, my plans have fallen through. And then what do we do? We call out to the Lord in distress and say, God, maybe I should have asked you about this before I tried to do something with this. But I thought I had all the plans figured out. And sometimes God lets us go and turns us over to our stubborn hearts and our own plans. So we need to be careful. That's a scary verse for me. Verse 13. If only my people would listen to me and Israel would follow my ways, I would quickly subdue their enemies and turn my hand against 
their foes. Those who hate the Lord would pretend submission to him. Their doom would last forever. So what does God say? Look, here I brought my people out, I delivered them, and they turned against me. But I want to I feed them. If they would open wide, I would provide for them. But they don't listen. And so they don't listen. I allow them to do, do what they're going to do, and they get in trouble. But if only, God says, if only in the midst of our trouble, in the midst of our rebellion, if only we would listen to God. If only we would listen to God and follow God's ways, how much better would our lives be? And the, the craziest thing about that is that if you've ever followed the path of God and the ways of God and listened to God, you know how good things go. Even when things go bad, when you're following the way of the Lord, things are good. Even when things don't work out the way you think they should, and the situation seems to be going downhill, if you've gotten into that situation by being obedient to the Lord, there's a certain peace and a joy and a calm even in the midst of that. And he says, if only my people would listen to me and Israel would follow my ways, then what would happen? Then I would quickly subdue their enemies. If then God would work. Then those who hate the Lord would submit to him or pretend to submit to him, some of your translations may say. So God is saying, I want to work through you, my people, but I cannot work through you because you won't listen. But if you would listen, look at what I can do. I can do mighty things through you. Now, I have no doubt that that's true for all of us today, all of these thousands of years later that that is true that there very, very well may be things that God wants to do through us and show his power, but we, in a sense, as much as we can, limit God because we won't allow God to work through us in the way that he desires to work through us. And isn't it a shame when there's something mighty maybe that God wants to do, but, but God wants to use us to do it and we don't follow the ways of the Lord. But if only we would listen to the Lord. If only we would let the Lord work, then what kind of things may we see occur in our life? What kind of enemies that we are up against may the Lord do away with? What kind of mighty works may he do that may change the lives of those around us if we would listen to God? But will we listen to God or will we continue with our own plans? Verse 16 but he would feed Israel with the best wheat. I would satisfy you with honey from the rock. So God says, if you would call out to me, I would listen to you, I would hear you, I would provide for you, I would do away with all of the enemies, but I would feed you with the best of the best. I would take care of you. That's what he told Israel when he took them out of Egypt. He said, I'm going to take you to a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, quite literally, the land could have been flowing with milk and honey in some way. Perhaps that's just symbolic language of great blessing. Both could be true. Uh, perhaps in the last few months you've heard a song, honey in, honey in the Rock or Honey from the Rock, and I hear that song from time to time, and I said, I wonder what the reference is for that because I, didn't, I wasn't familiar, and lo and behold, I'm reading this verse, and I say, hey, here's the verse from that song. And we see a similar verse, and I believe it's Deuteronomy 32, 13, this idea of honey from a rock. Now, there's a couple of ways, perhaps, in which we could interpret this. We could interpret this literally, and it very well could be quite literal. That is, in the areas that the Israelites were in, there could have certainly been bees in some of the cliffs of the rocks, and it is certainly possible that there could have been areas where there was literally honey dripping from the rocks. So it could have a literal interpretation it also could have a symbolic interpretation because time and time again we see in the scripture, and here's your some homework for this week, Deuteronomy chapter 32. It's quite a long chapter, but read it and you will see that time and time again throughout that chapter, God is referred to as the rock. And so we see both in the Old Testament and the New Testament that God is our rock and it is our rock 
that provides what we need to sustain us. It is the rock that gives us the sweetness that we crave in life. So even if this is not literally honey flowing from rocks, there is certainly great symbolism that we can see that ties into the rest of Scripture and ties into the Lord and ties into Jesus Christ. And so what is the call here? To praise the Lord. Why? Because he delivers those who call out to him. Even when we are stubborn and hard-headed, even when sometimes God allows us to do things our way, God still says, but if you would come back to me, but if you would call to me, but if you would listen to me, but if you would obey me, it would be like getting honey from the rock. So maybe in all of the turmoil of our lives and the bitterness that we are up against with all the things of this world, perhaps we need the sweetness of the Lord's presence in our life, the sweetness of grace and forgiveness. And the honey comes from our rock, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you and thank you for these good words. And dear Lord, I pray that you would help us to be those who are obedient to you, who sing praises to you. And dear Lord, don't, don't get off track too much, dear Lord. God, I should be praying that we don't get off track at all, dear Lord. That should be our goal. But God, I know full well that there are days that we simply, we just are stubborn, dear Lord, just like these old Israelites that we read about. We are just as stubborn. And God, I pray that you would help us to seek your plans and to trust your ways. And God, even tonight, if we are following our own plans and our own ways, that we would repent, that we would come to you, dear Lord, that we would find the joy and the peace and the sweetness of your salvation and deliverance that comes through our rock, Jesus Christ. So God, I pray tonight that maybe there are some in the midst of hardship and trouble, <clears throat> God, that that each one of us would leave here knowing that we have found honey in the rock, God. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.